Good morning. Um, I'm sorry we're doing it a little bit differently today. Um, we've had some technical difficulties. Apparently, Facebook have updated and uh, my computer doesn't seem to want to recognise anything that we've done before. So I do apologise that we are running just a few minutes late. Um, we are today going to talk about part three of uh, being a rare Christian and part three is released. So we've had redeemed, anointed and now we're on to part three which is released. So um, we'll just start with a quick prayer and then I'll have a Bible reading and then we'll get into the message. Okay, so may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Oh yes, yes, may the words of my mouth be ever yours. Amen. So today's reading is Ephesians 4. <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 4 to verse 8. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, if you want to open them, it's always good to have your Bible handy. Okay, so there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father to all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. As I said, today's message is about uh, released, being released. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to give you the, the, the Bible, uh, the, the dictionary definition of what released is. And it says for, uh, to be released from bondage, to, so from confinement, free from that which constrains or fastens and be liberated from. Uh, it also means to release from pain and from emotional strain. Um, I'm sure we're all feeling a lot of that at the moment. Now there's three parts to this talk. Sorry, I'm getting signs here from, because we're doing it a little bit differently. I'm getting signs. Uh, uh, now, okay, Chris is telling me to slow down, but I know what I've got to do and there's a lot to get through. So, part one, released from the law. Christ says in Matthew 5, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear. For, for, from the law until everything is accomplished. And to anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. See, the thing is, the law is there to show us where sin lies. Where sin lies. Now, I, 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 I can't see what I'm looking at. I'm, I'm not seeing what you're seeing. So you have to forgive me if my movements seem a little bit different. So Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says, What should we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, Do not covet. The law is there to reveal sin. We were given the Ten Commandments. Uh, I'm sure if I asked, we'd all be able to just rattle them off um, all very, very quickly. Um, you know, but if you don't know, if you, if you can't remember them, uh, they're in Exodus 20 and they're also um, repeated almost word for word in Deuteronomy 5. You see, God gives us laws to guide us. The question I always think of is this, how do we know what is right from wrong? If nobody tells us, we don't know. We can't go with our own consciences, because I know from experience that some people have less, less of a conscience than others. Um, you know, I've seen it and I've heard it, and so I know this. Uh, conscience is a, a, a very, uh, it's a, it's a, an inner thing, and some people have more and some people have less. So we need the law to guide us. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, the law gives us very clear boundaries. When the law is presented in the Old Testament, it's saying to the people, this is what I expect of you. This is where you have to uh, move within these boundaries. And if you don't move within these laws, 
there are consequences for sins. Leviticus, um, read it from start to the start to, to end. It's all about uh, the prices that you have to pay, uh, the offerings that have to be made. Um, and, and these boundaries and rules are there for our benefit. Um, when I was younger, um, my mum would, would always uh, have rules and boundaries. Um, if you do that, um, if you climb on that, you, you'll fall. Um, if you do that, you get a smack. If you do that, you're going to be you're going to be late. You see, some rules like don't touch, like when the kids are with the fires and you said don't touch, they're there to protect. You know, uh, some boundaries are there so that you know literally what the boundary is. Where I used to live uh, in Tilsley, we used to live in a place called it was the Jig, and it was a row of terraced houses on a and it was on a terrace and they'd knocked all the houses down in front and we could see for probably miles and and the rule was just don't go out of earshot now that's great if you can shout if you can't shout very loud then you need it close um we used to have a little dog called um i think he was called laddie and he used to go off and my mum would go on the terrace and she'd whistle and from from the very distance we'd see this tiny tiny black dot running running across i won't say fields because it was an ex-mining town so um it was mainly um the waste but he would see his tiny dots the boundaries were within a shot rules are there to protect us rules are there so that we know where we stand see in romans uh, it says but sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of covetous desire for apart from law sin is dead if there is no law there is no sin do you understand that you see the second you have a law then somebody is going to end up breaking it um i wrote a little piece here it says there must be law so that sin can be revealed in us the same sin which christ died to set us free from if there is still sin the law which reveals the sin must still stand because if we sin it's because something tells us that it's a sin to do it remember at the beginning do not think that i have come to abolish the law or the prophets i have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them we'll probably get back to that but you see what we need to remember is that christ came as an offering for our sins he paid that redemption price because we are sinners because in Romans 8 it says for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in sinful man 1 Peter 2 says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed the thing is, <clears throat> the second you create a law, you create something which people are going to go against. Um, we see it all the time. We see it all the time. Um, we, we, you know, um, especially at this time where we know there's rules that we were supposed to abide by, and yet we see people floating those rules. You see, the law is there to provide boundaries but sometimes it can feel very restrictive see the law binds and restricts us but Christ he doesn't bind us he releases us from that he redeems us from our sins and our sins are there because the law tells us this is wrong to do in Galatians 5 it says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free and then it goes on to say stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery when Christ paid is at price when you are redeemed from all that you were don't go back to it don't go back to it and it doesn't say this sin will creep up it says and do not let yourselves be burdened again you're set free we talked about being anointed you know the anointing of the Holy Spirit coming on you we I, I cannot fathom anybody that, that would want to go back to that way. You see, 
I believe that we're called to something. I, I, I honestly believe we're called to something. If I believe if Christ calls you, you are called to something. If you're sitting on a pew, then you are called to something. The second that you accept Christ as your Lord and Saviour, he has a plan for you, you know. Everyone who's redeemed, everyone who's received that anointing is called for a purpose. When you receive an anointing uh, in, in human um, terms, um, you would um, anoint somebody to go and do a particular, to, uh, a particular job or a particular task. And, that, and, and when we receive that anointing, when that Holy Spirit falls on us, we are called, we are sealed. We talked about it last week, we are sealed um, to a task. And that's what we need to do. Now we may not know what or why or where, but we are called. 1 Peter 4 says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. It, everybody should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Now, you may say you've not got a gift, but I know that you have. I know that you have. You may have buried that gift deep down but I know it's there you see Romans 12 says we have different gifts according to the grace given us if a man's gift is prophesying let him use it in proportion to his faith it is if it's serving let him serve if it's teaching let him teach if it's encouraging let him encourage if it's contributing to the needs of others let him give generously if it's leadership let him govern diligently if it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. We all have gifts, different gifts, at different levels. 2 Timothy says this, that, we are, that, that he, he saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. He saved us and called us to a holy life. Just that, just that will set you apart from everybody else. But that's what Jesus has done for you and he did this before the beginning of time. I'll go on to say in 2 Timothy, it's actually before that part. It says, for this reason I remind you, to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. So don't be ashamed to testify about you, our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. See this is, my, this is a man that is in prison and yet Physically he's in prison, spiritually he's not. He's saying fan the flames. Man sat in a cell saying fan the flames. You see, this is a man that's released into Christ. Ephesians 4 says, there's one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one heart when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. When he died, we died with him. Our sins were taken, even before we committed them. He knew we were coming with him. He knew that when he ascended on high, we were called, we were going to um, be saved, we were going to go with him. Ephesians 4 again, it was, it, it, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. We're not called to do nothing. We have a five-fold ministry that's to prepare God's people for works of service. 
It's not to prepare God's people to be comfy sat in a pew. It's not to be called to service to, to, and your service is to watch somebody else doing something. You are called to serve God. And in serving God, you serve the kingdom of God. And, and we just keep doing this. It carries on to say, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We need to be mature. We need to take advantage of this. I'm going to talk about the five-fold ministry. Now, when I was doing this talk, some of the stuff that's uh, um, some of you have heard some of this stuff before because it's very close to my heart i do believe the five four ministries um but i also believe that we're all part of it so um now you, forgive me because i practiced this last night on, on 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 the laptop and now it turns out we're doing it a different way so it goes like this look at your hand now make a fist when a fist is folded all the fingers are the same length. When extended, each finger functions independently and yet it's still attached to the hand. Every finger is interconnected but has a unique function. Do you understand that? Just as each finger is different in size, length and function, so it is with each of the ministries of God, the fivefold ministries. Now we can function with only one. It's not easy, but it's possible. Now I'm not talking about the physical here, I'm talking about the spiritual. I'm talking about the whole kingdom of God. We can function with one. I know churches that are functioning with none, but not effectively. But they can function with one. Two are better. And we're going to talk about what these gifts, are, the, these ministries are in a minute. So they can talk, the, the, some churches can, can function with two. Three fingers makes ministry a lot easier. Because you've got more uh, things to call on. Um, more, fit, more people to, to do things. Four is great. Four is great. And five, well that, that's it. That just makes the job so much easier. You see, each of those fingers represent one of the five four gifts. Now, the thumb is the apostle. He's the one that connects all the fingers. He's the one that works alongside all of them. Strengthening, strengthening, enabling the hand to grasp. Do you know how hard it is to pick things up if you can't hold on to them with the thumb? I used to uh, used to have an Auntie Mary, uh, my Auntie Mary, and she um, she had arthritis, and, th and she couldn't use her thumbs. Now you try picking things up with just your fingers. It's possible, but it's not easy. But you get that thumb, you can grab anything you want. Now the thumb is the apostle, and the role of the apostle is um, is to extend churches. Um, they tend to come in and they set up churches in areas that where, where they needed. I'm gonna. I would say deprived, but I'm not talking necessarily. I also have a thing that says, you know, some of the most deprived people are the people that have got money and good jobs and spiritually bereft. But an apostle will move into those areas where there's a need. He will serve it. He'll bring a vision. He'll bring. He'll come on a missional journey. Um, it'll come with great courage and endurance and I'll tell you something else he does he encourages the next is the forefinger this is the prophet now he's connected to the apostle and as we're going to learn later he's helping the evangelist to point the way the prophet points the way. He's over there. He's there. He's here. Inside. His role 
is to strengthen the the new believers and 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 even uh, people that have been there many years in the faith uh, to help them know what's the right thing to do for God. He has an insight. He has revelation into to, to, to God's word, and he's he's bringing forth what God wants you to know. But he's only one man. He has to have the support of the others. The next finger is the evangelist. I have to be careful there. Now he works closely, if you look, with the prophet, and this is the pastor finger. He works closely. But the evangelist, if you look, he extends beyond them. He extends into the world further than the others. I bet you're all looking at your hands now, aren't you? Just checking that your fingers are longer. They are, because that's the role of an evangelist. He expands churches. He brings in new members. He, he, he brings in new people so that uh, you're able to, to disciple them. He has a passion, and I've seen some wonderful evangelists, and they have passion and power and the confidence that, that I just could never have. But I love to watch an evangelist at work. A true evangelist because they bring people into the kingdom they're the ones that grab they're the ones that extend out the next finger is the ring finger it's the pastor's finger or sometimes called the shepherd's finger now the the, the chef the, the pastor finger works very very closely with the evangelist so the evangelist brings them in and the pastor he's gonna look after them okay now it's on the ring finger because the pastor is the one when all the others come and go the pastor is the one that's married to the church i'll give you a nod there Trevor christians because you're the one that showed me this okay He's the one that's married to the church. He he leads the church. Um, he, he's sort of like the head of the household. Not an iron ruler. He doesn't rule with an iron fist. He's there to rule with wisdom. Uh, you know, He's there to help people develop the ministries. Um, it's like a parent bringing up kids. You want them to do the best they can, but you want them to do something. You know, and he's going to do that with through 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 training, through encouraging. You know, his purpose and his goals are simply to make his flock the best one it can be. He wants to improve the skills and the knowledge and he wants them to be all that God wants them to be. But then we come to the little finger. Now the little finger, if anybody's worked it out, is the teacher. He's connected to and works closely to the pastor. Any pastor that runs his church with no help and does not is not willing to um, to to give other people any roles or commitments is not a good pastor. If he can't delegate correctly, he's not a good pastor, because people have roles to play, and the pastor's role is to 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 identify them and to to move those people into positions where they can fulfill that now a teacher he's the littlest finger but he's the one at the end of the day when the pastor and the evangelist and the prophets and the apostle are given the big messages he's the one that opens the bible and says let's see what it says he's the one that has the ear of the world and i think i showed this to some people the little finger is the easiest one to get into the ear he brings balance to the hand you don't realize uh, until you can't use it um, once again um, I once had a what carpal tunnel syndrome some of you will know it it meant literally that my finger was, was either there or there and there was no in between um, and and sometimes it was locking both now when you can't use your hand when when, when, the, when that little finger it's not functioning correctly it actually affects your hand in a really bad way 
because you just can't seem to be able to, to, to make head and tail of what you're doing. He brings balance. That's what the little finger does. He's the one that's going to help to grow your church. He's the one that's going to faithfully be there week after week after week. He's going to, he, he, like the pastor, hopes for the best for the people. He has his vision. Now, having talked about those five, five ministries, we understand that Jesus fulfilled all five of those. Jesus was the teacher. Oh, I can't do this. I put them in the wrong order. So, it was the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. He did all five of those. Now, I believe that everyone, and I do mean everyone, works somewhere in those five ministries. I know some people will say, look, there are other ministries and we'll do this and we'll do that. But I'm telling you now, I believe that they fall within these five ministries. They'll say, well, there's administrations and other things. I believe they fall within those five ministries. And this is why. Like a finger has different parts. And I know Chris is going to laugh at this in a second. Um, each finger is made up of different bones. Does anybody know what those bones are called apart from guessing David does? Do They're called phalanges. And in your hand, there are 14 on each hand and on each foot, making a total of 56. Now, in the fingers, there's three of these different bones. And you know, I never realised this till I was reading it, but there's only two in your thumb. There are only two in your thumb. But I believe that each person works within that ministry. I believe that a prophet works right at the edge of that ministry. No, um, an apostle. But somewhere along that line, there are roles for others. Even if it's a minor role. Even if it's only giving. I believe the same with every other ministry. Some live out on the edge of that ministry. And some play a lesser role nearer the hand. Everybody is in there. There are roles within each ministry that each of us will fulfill. You need to find what that role is. If you don't know now, go to your pastor and say, what do you think my role is? Each bone in that, that hand fulfills a role. Each bone has a name. Each, each bone supports the others and supports them to what? We're coming to the end now because we're on the third one. We're on the third one. Krista's giving me signs there, but I don't, I can't tell what it means. We are released into the world. So, unless I'm mistaken, we've had... Um, released from the law, released into Christ, and now we're going to fulfill our purpose. We're going to be released into the world. Um, I'm not sure how long I've gone on. I hope I've not gone on too long. I love this bit in 1 Peter. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter fulfills a role. Okay? To God's elect, that's me and you, strangers in the world, this is not our home. Every, every possession you have is given you by God and it's not, you're not going to take anything with you. Trust me, you're not. Scattered throughout, I'm just going to say, Asia. I, I could try them all, but I, I'm, I'm a bit of a wimp. But I'll tell you something, when I read this, I went to the Amplified Version, and I'm telling you, this is the better version. Because it doesn't say, it says, um, um, Peter, an apostle, a special messenger. That's what an apostle is, a special messenger of Jesus Christ. To the elect exiles of the dispersion, scattered, and then this is the word I love. 
sold sold okay abroad in Pontus Galatia Cappadocia Asia and Bithynia we were chosen and foreknown by God the Father and consecrated sanctified made holy by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ the Messiah and to be sprinkled with his blood may grace spiritual blessing and peace be given you in increasing abundance that spiritual peace to be realized in and through Christ freedom from fears agitating passions and moral conflicts Wow I though just even just the last bit makes me freedom from fears agitating passion and moral conflicts that's what we're in at the moment but going back to that scattered I always think that the devil thinks he's won because he thinks of us as a scattered people running away afraid you know you have a battle you lose you run away you scatter but I think it's different see I think God would have us understand that we're not scattered we are sold we are sold like a farmer sows his seed he scatters, he grabs them and he scatters them on the ground but he's expecting fruit from that He's expecting a reward. He's expecting to reap a harvest. We are sold into every situation for the producing of spiritual fruit. Into every situation. Right now, Sunday the 10th of May, 2020, we're all sat around. We're waiting to hear from the government uh, of Great Britain to see if they're going to ease this lockdown. They've managed to not just cage people, but have managed to get the people to desire being caged. And they desire it above all else, including the rights to freedom. They've give, given up the right to freedom. We're now living in, and I think we'll continue to live in a world where social isolate, social, so, being isolated from one another, to some degree or another, that's going to be the normal thing. It's going to be the norm. People's fears, and I see it all the time, people's fears will keep them apart. Indeed, I've seen it on Facebook where people are reporting one another because they're out doing this and that and the other. A father reported his son because his son went out playing. That's what they said on, on the internet. You see, people want to feel like everybody's cooperating for the greater good. So they're in isolation and they're separating themselves from one from another because of fear of catching a virus. They're willing to, 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 to I don't know what the word is, to, to inform on, on people, one another. But we know this is true, we know this is coming, because in Luke it says they will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, you get the idea. There's going to be a great division, even through families. Now as we're coming out of this, we have a great work to do, we are going to be released into the world, we are already released into the world in one way, even through this medium of being able to talk and and bring the word of God, but we need to show them that there's a way that they can see, that they can feel uh, uh, um, this release from fear, this fear of this virus, this fear of being near to one another, I, I, can't, I can't remember that, fear which seems to be removing people's free will, they seem to be of this mentality that says the government will tell me what to do. The government will tell me what to do. But the government are just men. Release when it comes from isolation will not an uh, answer their problems. Release which comes from knowing that Christ has redeemed us. Uh, that from knowing that we have the Holy Spirit anointing us and filling us. This is where true release comes from. Not from man. But from God, it's not the government that says you are released now. It's God who says, I have done this. There was a time, 
and I feel quite strongly about this, where the church used to inform and advise kings and rulers and governments uh, about how they should go, what they should do. Now the government tells the churches what to do. And the vast majority have obeyed unquestioningly. They've gone, oh, we'll find a new way of doing it. But unquestionably, they've done what they said. Jesus never once said, don't ask questions. But he did say, count the cost. Count the cost. It says in Luke 14 about this. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays a foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him. Count the cost. When you know the cost, pay the price or walk away. And the cost for us is everything. I've talked uh, um, a lot in the past, um, well this week and the last two weeks, uh, about the cost of prices being paid. And, 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 and now like, like those disciples who went into the nations to proclaim Christ's death and resurrection for the salvation of those who would believe, we are released into the world to bring that same message, a message that brings good news and it brings peace to the brokenhearted. It proclaims freedoms for the captives. The first um, Bible reading we did was uh, Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now I know people are going to say that's Isaiah and he's talking to somebody. But I tell you now it's the same God and God's message has always been the same. Always been the same. If you tell me it was for then, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Do you know why? Because it's the same God. It's the same beliefs. Last week... Well, earlier on this week actually Krista found a book and it, it, we, we went to a meeting and somebody prophesied over us and I, and, I, and I think I said something and this was 12 years ago 12 years ago and my thoughts are still the same 17 17 years ago my thoughts are still the same do you know why because my thoughts are rooted in what I know of God and God's thoughts are the same now as they were then and we have to understand that we are at a crossroads in our faith. Do we follow the masses right now or do we follow the narrow path? A path that the majority will never follow. They will never follow it. It's not an easy path. And in that path, we're not called to condemn anybody. We're called to pray for our leaders. We want wisdom and understanding. But at the same time, count the cost. Don't be willing to follow them blindly. Their game is not about salvation. Their game is not about your eternal soul. Their game is about getting you to vote for them now. It's a different game. They play games with your lives. God doesn't. These people, they may lead where we shouldn't want to go. We've already gone to a place where the churches are shut down. That breaks my heart. See, our choice is simple. We can have faith in God or we can have faith in the government of man. We can be released to do God's work or we can be captive to a, a, a community fear, a fear of stepping out into the streets. I stole this quote off Krista, it's a Solomon Burke quote, if you doubt, you do without. I don't want to do without. Jesus sent out his disciples. He sent the 12 out and we're gonna go, wow, there's 12 disciples. And then he sends out the 72 disciples. So we know there's more. And Jesus sends us out now. He calls us the same way he called his first disciples. When he called his first disciples, he said, come follow me. And they gave up everything. These were businessmen. These were men of great standing because they fed their communities. They were fishermen. They owned their own businesses. 
and they just walked away and followed Christ. And that's what we have to understand. We need to be prepared to give up everything. Listen to these words that I'm going to speak to you right now and just dwell on them and think about them. In Matthew it says, all authority, this is what Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not to me, to Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We need to be prepared to give up everything. Abraham, when he was took his son Isaac to be sacrificed, was giving up everything. His whole future, his whole being was wrapped up in the fact that Isaac was the chosen one. All that when God said, look at the stars, look at the sand, can you count them? No, everything's going to come from Isaac. And then God says, I want him as a sacrifice. Abraham was willing to give up everything. We have to be willing to give up everything. And when we give up everything, we have to give it up joyfully. This is the conclusion for my talk. Then. This came to me, and I had to rush this through, because I was in the shower this morning, and it was just like, this came. When a farmer's in a field ploughing, he can't look back. In fact, the Bible says this. No one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Don't look back. And do you know why a farmer doesn't look back? Because he wants his furrows to be straight. When he's ploughing his furrows, he wants them to be straight. Do you know how he does that? He finds a fixed point on the horizon and he steers towards it. He steers towards it. So he sets a stick at one end and a stick at the other. And Jesus says... I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. The first and the last. You plough your furrow between those points of reference. There's nothing else that matters. You want to do a straight furrow, you set your markers, the Alpha and the Omega, and you get them on the, in your sight and you plough a straight line. Jesus is our fixed point. I could tell you a story when I was uh, looking this up for uh, uh, something else, I can't remember what it was. You, you see, the farmers all tell you the same story. Oh, I have a friend and he started ploughing and he fixed his, and his fixed point and he fixed his point on the cow in the field opposite. See, the problem is everything else in our lives is going to shift. The cow moved. When he looked back, his furrow was everywhere. Because the coward moved. We need the fixed point. Jesus is all we can do. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Look ahead. Don't look back. Whatever's gone in the past is gone. It's nothing to do with you now. Just keep keep plowing that line. There's something else that comes to mind. By working in the field, the farmer is obeying all the laws of the road. All the laws of the road. Do you know why? Because he's busy with his business. But his business does not break any of the laws, any of the rules of the road. Keep in the fields where God has sown you in to be and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Plow a straight line. One other thing came to me about the narrow path. A farmer knows where the narrow path is. Because it probably runs straight through his field. I see on the TV all the time confrontation between farmers because people are treading on the footpaths, the single file footpaths. But a farmer working in his field, he knows where the footpath is. It's in his field. It leads through his field to where it's going. I want to just close with a quick prayer. So Lord, I just thank you for just revealing all these things to us, Lord. Keep us, keep us on the straight path. Keep our eyes fixed on you. 
Let us not do anything that is not veer to the left or the right. Let us keep in our field. Lord, where you've sown us, let us do great works. Let us, let us reap a, a, a crop of, a, a, of souls for you, Lord. Let us bring people to you. Lord, just show us the way. Keep our eyes fixed on you in all we do. So, Lord, we ask that uh, you bless each one of us this day in Jesus' name. Reveal to us your will. Reveal to us your purpose in our lives. So, Lord, bless us, we ask. Amen. I'm going to say goodbye and I hopefully we'll see you next week for the last part.